I think it was Ronald Reagan in like the 70s when he was governor who said the states should take over control of Medicaid. Every budget we have had as Republicans, when I was budget chair writing my roadmaps or the path to prosperity, every one of our Republican conservative budgets said, let's get Medicaid control back to the states. In an honor to the principle of federalism, give the states and the governors the freedom and the flexibility to customize the care for their low income populations, how they think needs to occur. Unlike Medicare, which was very much structured to be a national program for you know elderly people that would allow essentially everyone across the country to have access to the same benefits, Medicaid had a different structure because it was for poor people. The structure was to give states power to decide about benefit levels, eligibility, what would be covered and what wouldn't, who would be a part of the program and who wouldn't. And this was the kind of flexibility that the southern states really wanted, because in many of those states, the largest share of the poor population were people of color, and they wanted to be able to control poor people and people of color and any intersections between the two. And so any social program that catered to those folks explicitly, they insisted on local control. You want to give not just states, but localities, counties, townships, all of this power and discretion to decide who gets what and how much. The national programs that are more equitably administered and that are more protected from the kind of variability of politics and less vulnerable, those programs are national, they're centralized, and they're overwhelmingly white. And then the programs that are less protected, more politically vulnerable, and less centralized so that states have lots of power are much more heavily populated by people of color. Way back in 1798, the federal government first wades in to health care and says, you know what, we'll help, you know, U.S. veterans and we'll have a fund to cover their hospital care. And it's a very limited group of people who we see as deserving. It's only going to be men. It's only going to be white men. It's only going to be people who have served. They're only going to help specific people who we deem to be worthy. That's how any federal intervention for a very long time looks. And then everything that's happening underneath that is totally up to states and localities. And they get to decide, you know, what sorts of health programs or health policies they want to implement or not. And for a very long time, most places just are doing very little. Once we get to the 1930s, in the wake of the Great Depression, things get a little bit more open in terms of how Americans think about social policy. I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. But we still have lots of tears. We still have racism, and we still have really important class distinctions in the U.S. So some of those things prevent health care from being, even being on the table. When FDR is doing all of these other expansive things, and it's like, let's have Social Security. Let's do these things that the federal government has never done before. And he takes health care off the table for a variety of reasons, and in part because of pressure from... Uh, Folks in the South, Southern Democrats who say, nope, some of these things are going to give the federal government a foothold that might endanger our ability to be white supremacists. For Southern Democrats, that was the fair when it came to health care. If suddenly you are paying for our hospitals and you are paying for all of these people to have access to health insurance and you tell us that you won't fund this hospital unless it's desegregated, what are we going to do? We'd rather you not have that power to force us to desegregate or to force us to treat people equally or even to force us to build hospitals for African Americans, even separate and unequal, wasn't acceptable. By the time we get to the 1960s, there's a real sort of demand for health care, right? And in particular for the elderly, there's a focus on the elderly at that point, which is why we get Medicare as like the major investment, like we're going to help elderly people, we're going to make sure that they all have 
access to health insurance. Our older people are likely to be hospitalized three times as often as younger people. But their income is less than half that of people under 65. The most ardent advocates for Medicare at that point really focused on Medicare and not Medicaid, right? Uh, because they thought that Medicare was going to go places and that eventually it was going to cover everyone, right? And they wanted to design it like a social insurance program, very similar to Social Security. You know, this is at a time where there's still this sort of cold war fear of anything that's socialized. And so health insurance that the government was involved in had been depicted, and it still is, as sort of socialized Medicaid, which was a bad thing. And part of what the advocates of, of universal coverage wanted to do was to connect Medicare to something safe that people knew wasn't socialism, wasn't bad. Your Social Security, everybody loves it. We're going to do a health care program that's similar to that. And there was a demand for this. It was popular. And the idea was we get people comfortable with this, with this way of funding health insurance for the elderly. And it will create an opening for us to build on it. And so the plan was next, we'll expand to children, and then we'll continue expansions. There are Southern Democrats in the mix at this time who see the possibilities here and who don't want that to happen. At the same time, they understand the demand, right? Lyndon Johnson had been elected and it had been a landslide win. There was not one Republican or Democrat who had opposed Medicare, who remained in office, right? And so it became really clear after that 1964 election that, like, we have to be behind this. And so it was a matter on the part of the Southern Democrats of limiting it. So interestingly, Medicaid actually got added as an afterthought and as a strategy on the part of a particularly powerful Southern Democrat from Arkansas, Wilbur Mills, as Mills' strategy for containing what was intended to eventually be a universal program, to be Medicare for all. And the logic was, instead of just doing this for elderly people, and initially it was just elderly people and it was just going to be hospitalization, insurance for hospitalization, and Mills, being very um, strategic, said, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we add a part that covers doctor's visits for the elderly too? Let's make this a little more generous. And why don't we also add a part that helps low-income people? And the logic was, if we make this a little more expansive, then it's hard in the next iteration to say, this isn't enough, we need to do more. Medicaid came out of this kind of strategic um, political maneuvering. And so it was a sort of capitulation in that moment to doing more in order to prevent demands for more going forward. It wasn't like out of the kindness of our hearts or because we had some sort of vision for equity and we really wanted poor people to have health insurance coverage. There were certainly folks who felt like that. But the kind of inclusion and funding of Medicaid was initially really as a backstop to stop universal coverage from really being able to happen in the long run. And some people say that that was a successful strategy later down the line when folks said, well, now let's expand. Let's do this for more populations. Republicans were able to argue, but why should we? I ask you to join me and the president in working for fundamental change in America's health care system to lead this nation toward quality, affordable health care for all Americans. We face a historic opportunity, and we must seize the moment. Uh, my view is the American people, the majority of the American people, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, said not this year, and we don't want all this government, we don't want everything else, and uh, we're not, we're not going to be defensive about that. We respond to the American people. Even though the march to universal coverage didn't happen, Medicaid itself did grow and did increasingly expand. But that historical legacy of that program that serves 
disproportionately poor and minority populations being controlled and limited by state and local prerogatives, that remains with us. I'm going to work as hard as I can to convince more governors and state legislatures to take advantage of the law, put politics aside, and expand Medicaid and cover their citizens. 